You're going to face adversity in life. And if you don't learn how to handle adversity, you could be known as a loser. And God did not create you to lose. You were born, you were created to win. But whether you ever become what God created you to be, if you're going to get your prayers answered, you got to learn how to deal with adversity. If you're going to get your healing, you got to learn how to deal with adversity. One of, the, one of your tests to greatness is learning how to deal with frustration and adversity. Frustration comes when you don't get the prayers answered or when the, what God said in his word don't seem to become a reality in your life. And you can trace it all back to adversity. See, there are two sides of you. That's the weak side and the strong side. God's desire is to make the weak strong and the strong stronger. Amen. There are some areas you're strong in and there are areas you're weak in. And once Satan finds the area that you're weak in, where your faith is weak, he's found the key to taking you out. That's why the Bible says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Joel 2, 11, he is strong that executed the word. Ephesians 3, 16 says, strengthen with might by his spirit in the inner man. I'm not speaking about a physical strength. I'm talking about a spiritual strength. Yes. See, you can have physical strength and deal with people, but when it comes to the devil, you've got to have spiritual strength. As the centurion told Jesus, say, I have authority with men, but so you have authority with devils. He said, my problem is devils, not people. Amen. Your problem is devils, not people. Amen. Until you learn how to deal with them devils that's bringing the adversity, you're going to have a problem. And as I told you one time, I don't know how many times, until you learn how to deal with the spirit of the problem, you will always have a problem. Because you can kill the person, but their spirit will get in the next fellow. And it's going to come right back. That problem will keep coming back at you until it takes you out. That's why you got to learn how to deal with the spirit of the problem. Amen? Amen. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs 17, 17, a brother or a sister is born for adversity. Why? Because we have an adversary by the devil. And his job, his nature is to kill steal and destroy. And Satan studies the areas that we're weak in faith. And once he finds those areas that we are weak in faith, he's found the areas that he can take from you. And little by little, he will take you out. Lord Jesus. But also the scripture said in Proverbs 24, verse 10, if our strength fails us in the day of adversity, our strength is small. You got to develop strength in the Lord. Paul told the church in Ephesians 16, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Not your might, his might. The only way that you can be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might is through the word of God in prayer. Remember what God told Joshua? You got to be strong and very courageous because where God is going to take you, Joshua, you got to be strong. You got to be able to confront your adversaries. Because in the path of greatness, wherever God's going to take you, you're going to face adversity. Amen. And you've got to be strong in the Lord to deal with the adversity. Whichever way it comes, you still have to be strong in the Lord to deal with it. Now, I want you to write this down and put it somewhere where you will always remember. I didn't put it on the PowerPoint, but you write this down. Adversity takes you out of your comfort zone. We like to live a comfortable life where there's no problem. We can go to the garden, just pick up tulips and sing. But that's not so. You're going to face adversity in this life. And God permits adversity to come. Because adversity takes you out or uh, push you out of your comfort zone and challenges that whippy attitude. Yeah, adversity pushes you out of your comfort zone and challenge that wimpy spirit, that wimpy attitude. Because God knows that if you don't get rid of that wimpy spirit or that wimpy attitude, you're not going to accomplish much in this life. Yeah. Crying would never win a battle. But the Bible says fight the good fight of faith. 
The devil hates a good, he hates a fight. He wants people to just lay over and just let him come in and have his way. But God said, we got to fight. He said, the kingdom of heaven suffers valor, and the valor take it by force. If you don't have some fight in you, you will not be what God created you to be, and you won't get your prayers answered. Amen. So God said, I will permit, permit adversity to come to push you out of your comfort zone so that I can get rid of that wimpy spirit that you brought into the kingdom. And that's what you see men and women quitting, throwing in the towel, copping out, because they don't have no fight. They don't know how to confront adversity. And see, Satan knows he'll study our lives to find those errors that we're not strong in, those errors that we have no fight in. Now, you can be strong in one area and weak in another. And the areas that you're weak in, those are areas that you need to get strong. And the areas that you're strong in, you need to get stronger. There's no satisfied position in the kingdom. No, there's no, 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 ever, don't let your faith go to sleep on you. Amen? Amen. See, it takes courage to stand for right and fight against wrong in tough times. You've got to have courage today just to stand for the truth. Because the people today don't want to hear the truth. And if you don't have courage, you'll take them and find yourself compromising. You'll stand for what you know is right. Tell your neighbor, we must be strong. We must be strong. To reach your full potential in Christ, you must be strong in the Lord. And the only way you can be strong in the Lord is through the word of God in prayer. Because courage is a spiritual force. Born of the word of God, supplied by the spirit of God. And if you're not a student of the word and prayer, I grant you spiritually, you're not strong. Now you can have physical strength, but weak strength. Spiritually, amen? amen. So you've got to have courage to rebuild. Especially when the building, when you've been torn down, if you fall, you've got to get up. Yeah. And rebuild. If you made a mistake, don't lay there. Get up. Get back in the fight. It takes courage to get back up and fight again. Amen. You can't defeat a courageous man because he's going to keep coming at you. Oh, and the devil knows it. You have to have courage to choose what is right when everyone else is choosing wrong. Amen. You have to have courage to change. Because you had all your dependencies into something else. Now you get saved and God said, let's change, change partners. Change your ways. You have to have courage to let go of your past, something you depended on all of your life. Now God said, now I'm your source, turn it loose. It takes courage. It takes courage to admit that you have a weakness, and you, especially men. Men hate to say that I need help. Men like to prove that I'm strong. No, no, no. You're going to need help. And the only person who can really help you is him. David said, I will look unto the hills where which come with my help. God is my helper. He's my very present help in the time of trouble. And as strong as I want to appear before my wife, I still need help. Yeah. It takes courage to have, just to forgive. Because see, if you forgive, look like people are going to take advantage of you. But can't nobody take advantage of you when you do what's right. It takes courage to be faithful to God in adversity. See, that's it. You got to use, you know what? God uses adversity to mold and shape us. Yes, God will use adversity to mold and shape you. See, when you're going through adversity, you don't look at it like the world sees it. I'm being refined when I'm going through something. And it's not always because you did something wrong. The Bible says you can just be walking along and fall. Right to the different temptation, tests, and trials. But it's a count it all joy. 
because you know God is refining you for something beyond your comprehension. Amen? Now look at this, guys. Read that right there. When hardship comes our way, do we respond, God, I trust you to bring me through this? Or do we tend to say, I'm doomed and there's nothing anybody can do about it? You are either a pessimist or an optimist. A pessimist sees wrong and bad in everything. And they are doomed from the beginning. But an optimist, they have a way of seeing good and bad. When they're going through something, they know it's only for a season. And I hate to think of you being a Christian and you're not an optimist. Because the Bible says, for we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen, they are temporal. You can change anything the devil is doing if you don't get caught up in what he is doing. Yeah, you can change anything the devil's doing if you don't get caught up in what he is doing. We don't focus on what the devil's doing. Our focus is on the Lord. Because whatever I'm going through is only for a season. And God permitted for me this season. And the best way to look at adversity is to say, I am being refined. See, if you see that as a refining process, you are going on through it. Because you know you're going to come out looking like pure gold. Ready for whatever God wants to do in your life. So let me ask you a question. Talk to me for a few minutes. What can I do when my feelings go from discouraged to hopelessness? Tell me. What can we do when our feelings go from discouraged to hopelessness? Pray? Well, that's a pretty good answer, but that ain't the one I'm looking for. Rejoice, that's a pretty good answer, but ain't what I'm looking for. Somebody said it. You turn to the Word. You turn to the Word. When you feel, uh, when you feel discouraged or uh, hopeless, when Abraham had no hope, he had hope because he looked to God. And when you feel discouraged or hopelessness, you turn to the Lord. You turn to the Word. And when you read the word, hope comes. And when you apply faith to hope, what happens? God comes to the forefront. Amen. See, this is what you got to learn. See, there's no substance in hope. But the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for. So when you apply faith to hope, faith gives hope substance. But you know what gives faith substance? It's the word of God. So don't tell me you got faith. You can't have faith of the faith of God without the word of God. It's the word of God that gives the faith of God substance. Because if you don't have a word with your faith, you can be saying something, but it's nothing but an echo. But when the word is in you, and when you speak, there's a substance in what you are saying. And the sad thing about it, you can't tell the difference from an echo and someone that's speaking, but the fruit identifies. The fruit identifies what's behind what is being said. So if there's no fruit behind what you have been saying, maybe there's an echo speaking. You got to get in the word and give your, get that word down in your spirit that when you speak, that's God talking. Because you're speaking the word and God stands behind the word, but it don't come from your head, it comes from your heart. Hey, your neighbor said, don't be an echo. Another question, why is it so important to forgive others who have wronged you? Come on, talk to me. What was it? So you can forgive them, that's good. But I'm, that ain't what I'm looking for. Talk to me. So it will stop the flow of God, that's right, but that ain't what I'm looking for. Come on, come on, talk to me. Why is it so important that we forgive people? Charles? Huh? It grieves the Holy Spirit, that's right, but that ain't what I'm looking for. You free yourself? That's true, but that ain't what I'm looking for. Come on, talk to me. Uh, uh, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Who has the answer? I've heard a lot of things, but I haven't heard the answer. What's that, Flora? When you forgive, you take that load off of you. When you don't forgive, you take on their sin. And when you take on, and when you are sinning, you can't pray with confidence. When you're sinning, you can't confront your enemy with confidence. 
Because sin produces an inferiority complex. Sin makes you think that I am insecure. I can't confront my enemy. That's why the devil wants you to not forgive because he knows you can't defeat your enemy when you're living in sin. So never confront your enemy out of the will of God. Because you're not going to win. And you're the one that comes up short when you don't forgive. And a lot of you guys say you forgive, but you know you haven't. You know you have them. Come on now. You know you have them. Because the way you look at them let you know you're not forgiven. Them. The way you talk about them let you know you haven't forgiven them. You know you haven't forgiven. I forgave them. No, you didn't. I can tell the way you talk. Tell them so your speech identifies you. Because you hate to say something good about them. <laughs> Let's look at another one. How can I find courage in the face of stiff challenges? You say to Jackie, turn to the word. He said, in all their ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct. Okay. I don't care what you're going through. The way out of it, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The, uh, the way out of anything is turning to the word. Don't ever confront adversity in your own strength. Let's look at it. Let's hear some good reading. Mark, the fourth chapter, verse 35 through 40. Read it with me. On the same day when evening had come, Jesus said to his disciples, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling with water. Verse 36. But when he was the stern boat asleep. Now, let me say this to you. Don't let the, God, don't let the Lord go to sleep on you. Don't let God go to sleep on you. How can he go to sleep on you? If you don't fellowship with him, if you don't fellowship with him, he'll be right in your house, but he's asleep. He was in the boat with him. The Savior of the world was in the boat with him, but no one wanted to talk. They want to talk with one another, but never no time with the Lord. And we're guilty of that. We'll talk to everybody but God. We spend a lot of time with everybody but God. You can find time for scandal. You can find time for this. You can find time for that, but no time for the Lord. Don't mess up my time. Scandal's on. Don't call me on the phone. Tell your neighbor the truth and set you free. So he was in the boat asleep on a pillar because there was no fellowship. And they awoke him and said to him, Master, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Why were they perishing? Why were they perishing? No faith. That's a good answer, but ain't the right answer. No fellowship, that's a good answer, but that ain't the right answer. Why were they perishing? Not enough word, that's a good answer, but that ain't the right answer. No hope, that's a good answer, but that ain't the one I'm looking for. Why were they perishing? No carriage. No carriage, that's a good word, but that ain't the answer. Yeah, let me ask it for you. You know why they were perishing? They had no vision of going over. Because the Bible said, without a vision, They couldn't see themselves going. God gave a command, but they didn't see like you. You don't see what he sees. So you're going to believe it can happen. Right. 
You don't see yourself healed. You don't see yourself blessed. You don't see what he sees. So therefore, what happened? You are perishing. You got to see it. Whatever you're believing, and how do I see it? I go to the book and see what he said, and I spend enough time in the Word to meditate on what he said till I begin to get common attraction, pictures. My, it affects my imagination, and I begin to get images of going to the other side. And when you know that you know that God said, I can go to the other side, you're going to fight anything to get in your way. Tell your neighbor, see, if you don't see it, you won't fight for it. Amen. They say, do you not care that we perish? We are perishing? Notice, then, God, then Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, he's talking to the sea, peace, be still, and the wind sees. And the Bible says, that was a what? Great come. So we need to look at something right here. He said, peace be still. So peace was there, but the winds of adversity disturbed it. And you know what? That, that storm would have taken them out had not Jesus been in that boat. Because peace was there, but they didn't recognize it. They didn't speak to it. Don't tell me you got faith and you're not speaking to your problem. Don't tell me you got faith and you're not speaking to the situation. Remember the lesson that Pastor Stockton taught us last Sunday? No, Sunday before last? The world was full of chaos, full of darkness, but he separated the light from darkness by speaking to it. He spoke light into darkness. Darkness was there, but he spoke the word. So he spoke light into darkness. And he said, light be. And there was life. But guess what? He would speak life into death. He said, life be. And death have to give up. See, what you speak. See, when you get full of the word. You're going to speak life into death and light into darkness. And if you're not speaking to the situation, it's obvious you're like them, you had no faith. Because notice what he stated there, but he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Let's look at this. We can learn something there. See, God permits a storm on the Sea of Galilee to teach Jesus' disciples a lesson on faith. He'll permit you to go through some trials to develop your faith. Because Jesus knew that he was getting ready to leave. So he said, if I don't teach these guys faith, they cannot fulfill the assignment that I give them. And if you don't learn faith, God can't make you be a, what he created you to be will never become a reality if you don't learn faith. Faith is not passive. Faith is active. And God permits us to go through trials. That's part of the molding and the shaping, equipping. Trials pushes us out of our comfort zone. Get rid of that wimpy spirit where you have no fight. Because if you don't learn how to fight, you can't represent God. He, even, if you study the Old Testament, he told Gideon, he said, everybody that is fearful, send them back home to wash dishes with the wife. Because God said, I can't put nobody on the front line that has a fearful spirit. Because, see, people carry spirit. And God said, you're not going to represent me out front fighting my enemies if you got fear in your life. Amen. So he said, tell everybody that have fear to go back home. 22,000 went back home. Good God Almighty. Say, <laughs> so, tell your neighbors, don't go back home, my now. 
But look at this, guys. Jesus told his disciples, he said, let us cross over to the other side. See, they didn't catch the vision of where God was taking them. The safest place in life is when you are in the will of God. But don't ever think just because you are in the will of God that the winds of adversity won't come against you. Because they were in the will of God, but the winds of adversity, the devil got into the storm to stop God's will from being done. And had not Jesus been on that boat, they would have never made it to the other side. They would have drowned. Something else we can learn. Jesus always expects a safe trip. But just because he expects a safe trip, that's not saying there's not going to be some adversity. Because if, if God's going to get you to where he called you, if you're going to get those rewards and those blessings, you've got to learn how to deal with adversity. And this is where a lot of people miss it and never receive the reward because they don't have no fight. A good sign that when you don't have no fight, the sign is you have no faith. Because faith will fight for what he knows is right. Master, teacher, say, do you not care that we are perishing? Yeah, he cared. But he gave them the assignment to go. He wanted them to learn how to lead. He wanted them to learn, Carl, how to take charge. He wanted them to learn how to follow through with the will of God. And even when adversity comes, he expected those guys, Jeff, to do the same thing he did. Because Jesus said, I only do what my father doing. He said, I only say what my father says. And he expect us to act like him, to talk like him, to think like him. And when adversity comes, he expect us to deal with it the same way he did. Because he was our as living example. The Bible says he was the expressed, expressed image of the Father. It was the brightness of the glory of the Father to study the life of Jesus. And God expect all of us to live this life the same way. Deal with adversity the same way. Deal with the adversary the same way. Same Lord. Same God, same faith, same spirit, same word. And he'll never change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you don't learn the value of using his word to deal with your adversaries, and you have them, you have them. You know what your adversary is? Not being able to pay them bills. You know what your adversary is? That body that is sick. Now, you don't see the devil with a tail and two pick for him, but he gets into your life. Your adversaries, anything in your life that's out of the will of God. It could be anything. Now, watch this, guys. Mark 4, 39. Notice what Jesus said. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And what happened? And the wind ceased, and there was a what? Great calm. He told his disciples to do that. Look at Matthew, the 17th chapter, verse 21. I don't have it on the PowerPoint. Matthew 17, 21. You got to learn this, guys, because the winds of adversity are going to blow against you. And if you don't learn this, what? We got to, we just act like Jesus. We just talk like Jesus. We are sons and daughters of God. Notice that seventh, look at verse 20. Verse 20 on the screen. And Jesus said unto his disciples, because they couldn't cast this devil out, and they wonder why. He said, because of your unbelief. But verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall what? Say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And then notice what he said, and nothing shall be imp impossible to you. So what do you say? Don't tell me you got faith and you're not speaking to the problem. Don't tell me you got so See, we put a lot of emphasis on the problem, but God put emphasis on the word. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. And you shout unto your enemies with the voice of triumph. And we triumph in the Lord. And Jesus said, if you got faith, that's a grain of muscle. So you're going to talk to the mountain. That mountain could be a not money to pay your bills. 
That mountain could be not enough money coming in your house. That mountain could be sickness and disease. That mountain could be anything in your life that is contrary to the will of God. It's a mountain that you got to move yourself. You have to move your mountain. Let me, let me say this. You have to move your mountain. You don't pray to God to come move your mountain. Jesus said, you talk to your mountain. You deal with your mountain. You deal with your mountain. God ain't going to come out of heaven. He said, I'll put you in the authority of God here in the earth. God says, submit to God and resist the devil. How do you submit to God? You submit to his word. How do I resist the devil? Through the word. Look at Matthew 21, 21. Matthew 21, 21. Notice what he stated there. Jesus answered and said unto his disciples. He said, verily I say unto you. He said, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do to this do this to this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, and, the, and he said, and it shall be done. It shall. Don't tell me you have faith and you're not speaking God's word to your problem or to your mountain. We talk too much about the problem, but tell your problem how big your God is. Amen. Tell your problem what God said. Amen. Tell your body, by your stripes, by his stripes, I am healed. Hallelujah. Are you there? Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Tell your neighbor, say something, say something. When they awakened him immediately, he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Whatever you want to happen, that's what you say. All right. Whatever you want to happen, that's what you say. And the wind seized, and there was a great calm because there was somebody of authority who had the voice of authority there speaking. Let me show you something, guys, I'll help you. But he said to them, he said, why are you so fearful? Why are you afraid of this storm? Why are you afraid of this mountain? Why are you afraid of what's going on? Because you have. And when you have no faith, fear will take over. And when fear take over, you lose every time. But God did not give us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear not. You cannot fear. 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 Never fear what tomorrow is going to hold because tomorrow is in God's hand. Now watch this right here, guys. Notice that. See, Jesus rebuked the wind or the storm. The word rebuke means to correct sharply. I mean sharply. You would correct sharply when you rebuke. He spoke a direct word to the storm. Peace. He didn't say, peace, be still. He, no, he spoke in the thought. Peace. Be still. He spoke into the storm. Peace. Because peace was somewhere inside of that storm. Their peace was somewhere inside of that storm. They saw the storm, but he looked through the storm and he said, peace, come out of that storm and be still. Amen. You got to look through the darkness and see the light. Yeah, you got to look through the darkness and see the light. See the victory. something else. He said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have? What is a sign of no faith? Fear. Fear, but that ain't what I'm looking for. What is a sign of no faith? Work. Work. That that's true, but that ain't what I'm looking for. What is a sign of no faith? No fruit. No fruit. That ain't what I'm looking for. Everything is all right. Close, but ain't close enough. What is a sign of no faith? I just not told you. I just not told you. No what? No vision? That's true, but I mean, what I'm looking for. What is a sign of no faith? No you know it. I just not told you. A good sign of no faith means no speaking. No speaking. 
Uh, he said, why did you have no faith? See, he, asked, he exercised faith when he spoke peace. There's a good side of there's no faith when there is no faith. Look at Mark 11, 23. <laughs> he taught them faith. There it is on the screen. In verse 22, he said, have the God kind of faith of the faith of God. And this is how the faith of God works. Every time I say, say, you raise up a finger and believe. Because all the things of God works this way. Believe him with the heart and confess him with the mouth. Romans 10:10. 10, 10, believe with the heart and confess with the mouth. So notice here, they asked him, how Jesus taught them the God kind of faith. And this is the verse that he taught them how to have the God kind of faith. For well, verily I say unto you that whosoever, that covers everybody, shall say unto this mountain, be that removed and be that cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he saith two times, shall come to pass, he or she shall have whatsoever they say. So three times he talked about saying, only one time he spoke about believing. There's a lot of Christians believe, but their belief haven't got to the point where they are. Speaking. You believe something, <laughs> but you know when faith takes over, because we believe and say it. All the things that God works that way, believing with the heart and confessing with the mouth. Believing with the heart and confessing with the mouth. Believing with the heart and confessing with the mouth. And this is what Jesus taught them, how the God kind of faith work. You believe with the heart and speak with your mouth. Your heart and your mouth has to be in agreement with what God said. If you're talking about the problem, you believe in mentally, but spiritually you're not. So because you can believe in your head. And you know when you're believing in your head because your words are not in line with what God said. All you do is talk about the problem. You believe the problem over the answer. The answer is God's word, but you're so consumed by how you feel of what you see or what someone else has said that it overrides what God said. Amen. Are you there? Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Now watch this right here, guys. Jesus, when well, he said, why are you so fearful? Why is it that you have no faith? What's a sign that they had no faith? They weren't faithful. Oh, you got it. <laughs> you finally caught on. After a whole night, you finally caught on. One good side where there's no faith, there's no talking. There's no speaking. Now watch this guys right here. Always faith says that God is in control. I don't care what's going on in your life. Faith always says the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my very transcendent help in the time. And sometimes you may say, Lord, I don't know what to do, but I know I can trust you. All I know is, God, I'm not going under because I'm going to put my trust in you. I'm going to stand on your word. Sometimes you just say, God, I'm standing on your word. I'm standing. I'm standing. I'm standing on the word. Now watch this, guys. You're gonna, you want to shout a little bit? So you, you know you have faith because Romans 12, 3 says, God has given to every man a measure of faith. Now, God has given you a measure of faith. You have enough faith to fulfill your assignment from God. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Now, everyone has an assignment from God, and God will give you a measure of faith to fulfill that assignment or to deal with the adversity that comes in your life. You've got enough faith to deal with those demons and devils that comes against you. But if you don't take the time to get into the Word and develop your faith, you can have it, but it won't do you no good until it's developed. Yes. Amen. And the only way you really can develop faith is through adversity. God permits adversity to come, to push us out of our comfort zone, to get rid of that wimpy spirit, attitude, who has no fight. God is hurt when his children don't fight. Yes, he is. Yes, he 
Because if I send my son out in the street and let somebody beat him up, I say, is that my boy? Oh. Did he take on his daddy's spirit? Because his dad is a fighter. <laughs> All right now. Yeah. I know I'm fighting. I send my son out there. He don't, he let people push him around. No, that ain't my, I got to take my boy to the gym or somewhere. <laughs> he got to learn how to fight, get them big bullets off of his back. Man, but we need to take you to the gym of the spirit to teach you how to fight. Well, that's what we're in now. The gym of the spirit to teach you how to fight, to get them big bully devils off of your back. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, say, follow me to the gym. Where is the gym? St. Peter's World Outreach yeah. Center, 3683 Old Lexington Road. Yeah. 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 Watch this, guys. He expects us to use our faith to deal with our fears. I don't care what comes against you. God expects you to use your faith. He's given you a measure of faith. He expects you to use your faith to confront your adversaries. He said, the heavens is mine, but I place the sons of men in the earth. And he expected us, he gave us faith to confront our adversaries. Faith is a weapon. Faith is an instrument. Faith is a tool. Faith is a resource that God has given us to deal with our adversaries. Something else. Faith, fear always accompanies adversity. That's why you can't give in to fear. Fear brings adversity. It keeps coming at you until it takes you out. Adversity keeps coming at you. If you don't learn how to deal with your fears and adversity, it keeps coming at you until it takes you out. Fear attracts people of fear. Fear attracts adversity. Something else. Fear causes us to project the very worst that can happen. It's never as bad as it appears to be. But when you're full of fear, it always looks worse than what it really is. When you find yourself doing things you know you shouldn't do or saying things. You get crazy when you get full of fear. But the Bible says perfect love. He that learns love is made perfect. Because you know God is not going to turn his back on you. He loved, you. he loved you too much to leave you out there. You won't leave your son in the street for somebody to come in and take him out. If he can't fight, you say, son, come on in the house. That's what you do, son. Come on in the house. You're not ready for that yet. I tell you what we used to do when we were in high school. It was a set by field. We all played sports, and we used to hang together. And we used to pick on some of the guys in school. You know that? And we, we'll get in, if we got in a fight with someone, and if we saw our friend couldn't handle it, then we'll break up the fight. <laughs> yeah, we would. We would pick on some of the, you know, the, 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 the we guys. And if you, some of them guys were tough. Them country boys, they were tough. I remember one night, one day a friend of mine named Arthur Lee, he got in a, he started picking on this guy, and this guy pulled a knife out. And he swiped that rabbit off the lead. And this rabbit said, you missed me. He said, he said, no, I didn't miss you. Look at your pants. And he looked up, and his whole pants were wide open. <laughs> we broke up that fight. Huh? That's how you rescued Nathan, wasn't it? The women don't know nothing about what we're talking about. Nathan said he rescued you too. I'm going to let Nathan preach next week. He's going to get you back. All right. Romans 8, 28, he said, And we know that all things work out together for the good. To them that love God, who are called according to his. You need to know that. Stay in the fight, because you're going to come out a winner. I repeat, stay in the fight. You're going to come out a winner. Amen. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. In God's appointed time, everything's going to work to your favor. Amen. 
And if you jump out of the fight, you never get the reward. Watch this right here, guys. Faith says God is in control. And that all things worked out to together for the good. Well, even this adversity will going to turn to my favor. Yes. Even this adversity, God's going to bring good out of it. Yes. The devil means it for bad, but God has a way of turning what the devil means for bad into good if you stay in the fight. Because yes, the Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver us out of all of them. For no weapon that's formed against us will prosper, and every tongue that rises against us in judgment, it is come. So tell your neighbor, stay in the fight. Stay in the fight. Don't quit. Don't jump out. Just get in the Word and just walk right on through it because there's a reward that's waiting you on the end. Something else you must learn, guys. Allow adversity to call your faith to action rather than into question. Yeah, allow adversity to bring your faith to the forefront rather than question God whether he means what he says. Whether God's going to stand behind what he said. He said he will never leave you nor forsake you. That he will be with you always, even until the ends of the world. He said, if I am for you, who can be against you? So don't question the word. Let your faith come to the forefront and begin to fight your way on through it. Don't question God. Let your faith come to the forefront and just fight your way on through it. Because all things work out to together for the good to them that love God who are called according to his purpose. God is aware of everything that you're going through. And he said, I've turned what the devil means for bad into good. You will have a testimony after you get through. And you will tell everybody, I went through this, but God. But God. I went through this, cancer hit my body, but God. But God, you went through it, but God stepped in. But God, God saw you through. But God, God had a man in. Oh, God. You got to have a testimony because you got to tell somebody else, yes, I went through it, but God saw me through. God saw me too. My testimony is God saw me too. God walked me through. Say, God walked me right through this thing. And you can say, you can say this. There were times my flesh wanted to give up, but I refused to give up. I had to walk it on now. You got to stay in the fight. Tell your neighbor, you got to stay in the fight. To have a testimony, you have to stay in the fight. Have a seat. Don't let the devil cause you to doubt the word. God is always true. God is always true. He said, let man be a liar, but let my word. Don't ever elevate another man's word over God's word. God has the last say so. But watch this right here, guys. Something else. Adversity reveals areas in which you need to act in faith and not fear. Now watch this, guys. I'm going to show you something there. When hard times come, say to yourself, now is the time to use my faith in another way. I'm not saying, when hard times come, adversity come, tell yourself you're up for promotion. Yes, when adversity come, you just have to tell yourself, I'm up for promotion. If I pass the That's why you can't quit, because if you don't pass the test, you disqualify yourself to the promotion. Now watch this right here. I'll give me another five minutes. The more you use your faith, the greater it grows. Now notice this right here. Peter was one of the trusting God means looking beyond what we can see 
to what God sees. You can't see from where you are where God's taken you. That's why you got to trust God. You got to trust God to see you through. You got to trust God to take you through. You got to trust God to, to get you to the other end. We learn more in our valleys experience than on our mountaintops. Because every time God's going to promote you, he's going to take you down through the valley to the other side of the mountain. Now, it's those valley experiences that qualifies you to go to the top. David said, yea, no, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He said, I will fear no evil, for God is with me. So when God get ready to promote you, he take you off of the top of the mountain, and he take you right down through the valley. There's something in that valley that qualifies you to stand on the mountain. And if you don't go through the valley experience, you can't stand on the top of the mountain. Come on. But it's the valley experience that equips us to stand on the mountain of glory. And every level of glory, every stage of glory, you got to go down through the valley to get there. Because you don't jump from one mountain to the next one. You go from that mountain, you have defeated all the devils on this mountain. Say, God said, now I want to promote you, so I'm going to allow you to go through some trials in the valley. Amen. It's dark in the valley. But the higher you get on the mountain, the more sunshine you will get. Yeah, the valley experience is a time when it's kind of dark, but you got to let God lead you. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? I will fear no evil. Why? Well, because the Lord is leading me. For the steps of a good man is ordered by the Lord. You got to hold on to the Lord, Penny. You got to, Brenda, hold on because the Lord is leading you. Tell your neighbor, just hold on. That's why you got to stay in the Word because God will lead you through that valley experience. Now watch this right here, guys. Now, Peter, you know the story of Peter. Peter was one of his disciples. Peter learned some things some of the other disciples didn't know because he was one of God's close disciples. Notice what Peter wrote there in 1 Peter 1, 7. He said that the trials of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perishes. He said the most valuable thing in your life is your faith. Not silver, not gold, faith. Because faith can bring things to pass that silver, even gold cannot bring. You can't buy healing with silver and gold. You can't buy a good marriage with silver and gold. But faith can. That's a lot of things faith can get that silver and gold cannot bring. So you don't seek silver and gold. You seek faith. But notice what he said. Your faith will go on trial. But notice what else he said. Though it be tried with fire. He said, let it be found in what? Praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus. What he is saying, when your faith is on trial, praise shall be out there in front. Honor shall be out there in front. Glory shall be out there in front. And then God will appear to your praise, your honor, and your So if you're going through a trial, you better find some kind of way to praise the Lord. You better find some kind of way to honor the Lord. And you better find some kind of way to give glory to the Lord. Because the Bible says God will appear to your praise. He will appear to your honor. And he will appear to your glory. You know what the Bible says in Psalm 50 verse 23? Whoso offers praise glorifies him. And to him that order his conversation aright. He said, I will show them the salvation of the Lord. We praise God with our mouth, but we also can praise God with a dance. We can praise God with a shout. Yeah. We can honor God with our mouth, but we can honor God in our giving. We can honor God in our work. There are many ways that we can honor God. But the Bible says, while you're going through a trial, find some kind of way to praise Him. Find some kind of way to honor Him. And find some kind of way to give Him glory. Yeah. Can I take another little side journey? Look at Luke 22, 31. Luke 22, 31. I wish y'all could get that on the screen up there. Luke 22, 31. Notice the boy on the trick up there. You know Peter? He loved God. Notice that, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you or that he may sift you as sweet. Because Satan knew that God was going to use Peter like he's going to use you. Satan knew that God had a plan for everybody. 
Satan knows if he can stop you in the beginning, all he's going to do is abort the will of God. And Satan knew that Jesus had taught Peter, but God also knew that he was going to take Peter places he never dreamed of going. He was going to make things happen in Peter's life that Peter could make happen himself. So Satan said, I will try to stop him in the beginning, and he'll do you the same way. He'll try to stop you in the beginning. He'll try to rob you of your faith. But notice what Jesus told Peter there in verse number 32. He said, but I have prayed for you. That your faith fail not. And he said, when you are converted, he said, strengthen the brothers. It's an amazing. He didn't pray for Peter. He prayed for his. So when someone is going for, through a trial, you don't pray for that person. You pray that their faith don't fail them. If I'm going through a trial, let's pray for pastor. No, don't be in a hour praying for pastor. Pray for me that my faith. Will fail or not. Pray that my faith will endure whatever I'm going through. Because we do a lot of praying for people. Oh, God, save him. Oh, God, heal him. Oh, God, deliver him. Now pray that they have faith. Hey. Because that's what the devil's after is your faith. He's stunting you. He's after your faith. And Jesus knew that. It wasn't Peter that Satan was trying to destroy. He wanted to destroy his faith. These trials you're going through, it's coming against your faith. These tests or whatever's going on in your life out of the will of God, it's an attack on your faith. We could spend all night praying for you, but until we pray that God will strengthen your faith, And notice what God told Peter. He said, Peter, once you are converted, teach the brethren. He said, once you make it through, because I'm going to pray for your faith, and you will make it through. He said, well, when are you going to learn something out of this? He said, I want you to teach the brethren. We just not, uh, gave you 1 Peter 1, 7, and Peter wrote that after he was converted. He said, at the trying of your faith, let it be found in what? Praise, honor, and glory. That's what he said. He taught, he learned something there, that when he's going through something, praise, honor, and glory have to be at the forefront. But he didn't stop there. Look at 2 Peter 1, chapter 1, 2 Peter 1. Put it on the screen, 2 Peter 1. Notice there in 2 Peter 1, all of these things was written after his conversion. Notice the same of Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained what? Life. Precious faith. What is he talking about? The faith of Jesus. The faith of Abraham. You have. When God gave you a measure of faith, that's the same faith that Abraham had. That's the same faith that Jesus had. They all have it because there's only one faith. There's only one faith. Jesus didn't have a different faith than us. Abraham didn't have a different faith than what we have. All of it came from God. Because God is the one that gives us a measure of faith to deal with our adversaries. And now here is Peter said, unto the brethren or the sisters who have obtained like precious faith with us how? Through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 2, notice what he said. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, according as his divine power has given unto us all things all things unto life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him who has called us unto what? Glory and virtue. So now, don't ask for it. Let your faith bring it to the forefront. It's already given to you. For as God is concerned, you already have healing. For as God is concerned, your bills are already paid. For as God is concerned, you have everything that pertains to life and godliness. It's in you, but your faith brings it to the forefront. It's in you. Healing is in you. The healer is God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The blesser is God. The deliverer is God. He's in you, but it's your faith. Your praise, your honor, and your glory brings them to the forefront. And then notice what he said. He's called us into this glory and virtue. Verse 4, I love to read verse 4. 
whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. These promises, they are divine promises. It's the word of God. That through these divine promises, we now can become partakers of the divine nature. But notice what these promises do. It causes us to escape the corruption that is in the world that comes through lust. These divine promises, when faith is applied, causes us to overcome. The Word of God always supersedes what is natural. Yes. 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 Uh, but take me back. I'm through with you guys. I'm past my time. I wish I could read the rest of that verse there. Boy, there's some goodness there. Read it when you go home. There, I think around verse 10 to 7, he'd say, if you, abound, if you abound in these things, you will never fail. That's what verse 10 says. He said, if you are bound and round up, verse 10, 11, he said, these things are in you and you are bound, you will never fall. Yes. He said, add to your faith virtue, the virtue of knowledge, the knowledge of temperance. But my time is up. Tell your neighbor, praise, honor, and glory shall always be out in front. When you're going through something, praise, honor, and glory shall be out front. You see, this is why you can't get upset in the church if someone is praising God. Because your, your bills are paid, your thirst is quenched, everything is all right in your house, but you don't know what's going on in that man's house. So don't judge me because everything is right in your house. I got to praise him. When I think of the goodness of Jesus, and all that he's done for me, my soul shout hallelujah. Praise God for saving me. You about to lose your mind. You got to praise him. You don't know how you're going to pay your bills. You got to praise him. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You got to praise him. Your body is full of pain. You got to praise him. You believe in God for the salvation of your children. You got to praise him. You believe in God to straighten out your husband, your wife. You got to praise him. You, everything might be all right in your house, but you haven't been in that other man's house, that other woman's house. Her dog is getting crazy. Her husband's getting crazy. And let me say this. I need to say this. My heart goes out to these single mothers today because we have a lot of single mothers just out there just taking care of their family. What? I feel my heart goes out. I do a lot of praying for our single mothers. The husband's out shooting marbles, playing in somebody's garden. And she's left with those children. You know she's tough. She's got to praise him. She don't know how she's going to pay her bills. She don't know whether there's going to be food on the table. She ain't got a man holding her hand, helping her. She's All she's got is she and Jesus. Some of you guys, you, you got your husband, your wife, you got a little help. Some of these ladies right here, all they got is God. They got to praise him. They lose their mind if they don't praise him. There's a lot of pressure on these women. Get quiet. We don't do that. You'll say that because your bills are paid. Right. Your thirst is quenched. That's right. Tell your neighbors, I got to praise him. See, one of your tests to greatness is learning how to deal with adversity. That's all I have. For you.
Tell your neighbor, say, I got to praise him. I don't have no job but to praise him. I don't know how I'm going to make it sometimes, so I got to praise him. I don't know when I'm going to have food to feed my children, so you got to praise him. I have no choice but to praise him. Don't let someone else stop you from praising the Lord. Don't let someone else stop you from honoring God. We have to glorify the Lord with our mouth, with our body, in the church. We honor him, we praise him. And when I think of the goodness of Jesus, when I, guess what? When I think about the number of times that he brought me out, then I, know how, I didn't know how it was going to come out. When you want to quit the throwing the towel, there was something to say, go on. Seemed like there was a force behind you that's pushing you to say, get up and just go on. Get up and just go on. Tell your neighbor, get up and just go on. Tell somebody, get up and just go on. 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 Get up and just go on, John. Get up. Get up and just go on. 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 Get up, Robert, and just go on. Get up, Mac, and just go on. Get up, and Mac, you need somebody else, and just go on. Get up, Ronnie, and just go on. Get up and just go on. Yes. 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 I'm not going to sit down on God. Carla, I'm not going to let the devil cause me to sit down on God. I got to get up. I got to tell somebody about how good the Lord is. I got to tell somebody. Donnie, I got to tell somebody how good my God is. I got to tell. I got to tell somebody about how good my God is. I got to tell somebody. Yes, I got to tell somebody about how good my God is, Chris. I got to tell somebody. 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 Yes, I got to tell somebody. I got to tell it. 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 I gotta tell it. I gotta tell it to somebody. Yes. Oh, I gotta tell somebody. And my God is a good God. God has never forsaken me. Over these years, Penny, he has never forsaken me. Come on, baby, stand with me and tell my people he's never forsaken us. We've been through a lot of trials. We've been through a lot of trials that you didn't know about, but God saw us through. He saw us through. We've been through many trials. Here in this ministry, we've been through many trails. In our personal life, we've been through many trails. And all we had when we was in the trials was a word from God. And that's all Jesus had when he went to hell was a word from God. If you go through, I'll rescue you. If you go through, I'll rescue you. Yes, he did. You know he did. You know he did. I'm a testimony. Tell your neighbor, I'm a testimony. I'm a testimony that he'll see you through, Paul. He'll see you through, Penny. He'll see us through, Penny. Let me 
ask you a question. Have a seat. Have a seat. Look around. Have a seat. How many people would testify that he's a healer because he healed you? Have a seat. Have a seat. How many people would testify that God answered your prayer and made a way out of no way? Have another seat. How many people can testify that, well, you didn't know what to do and didn't know how you're going to make it through? God saw you through. I didn't know what to do. I said, Lord, I'm going to trust you. He's a faithful God that keep his covenant. Y'all sit down, I'll be here all night. I'll be here all night. Can I give y'all just one more scripture? Can I, baby, just one more time? I got to get, put Psalm 66, verse 10 up there. Psalm 66, verse 10. If you can get it up there right quickly. I know we don't have no, you don't have no wall. There it is. Notice what David said. For thou, O God, has proved me. Thou has tried us as silver is tried. Verse 7. He said, Thou brought us into the net. He said, Thou laid afflictions upon our loins. Verse, verse 12. He said, Thou has caused men to ride upon our heads. We went through the fire and through the water. But what happened? But thou brought us out into our resting place. He brought us out, didn't he? He brought us out, didn't he? He went through the fire. He allowed things to happen. But he brought us out. He brought us out. He brought us out. He brought us out. Now let me tell you something. Now let me tell you something. I, have much, I didn't have a chance to say this Sunday. But Saturday morning after we had prayed in tongues for an hour, the Lord spoke a word to me. He said, I want you to get quiet. And this is what he told me. He said, I'm going to speak a word to you through Sister Fab. That's what he said. He said, I want you to get quiet because I'm going to speak a word to you through Sister Fab. We got quiet. Rebecca whoosh, took us through a, a time of worship. But I knew that God was going to speak a word through Sister Fab. I just waited. I just waited. We got quiet, I just waited, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of God began to speak through Sister Fair. Uh, you know what the word of the Lord came and said? You're entering into an abundance. Increase, 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 increase. He said we're entering into that stage of abundance. It's time for increase. So whatever you're going through, go on through it. Because abundance and increase is on the other end. Yes, we're entering into the season of abundance and increase. Increase. He's the God of increase. He's the God of abundance. Give God some glory. Give God some praise. Give God some honor. My God 
is a great God. He brought us out into our wealthy place. Let me teach you something. The blessings don't come before the trials. The blessing follows the trials. But all things work out together for the good. To them that love God, who will call according to his purpose. He may have a seat. Say increase. God is increase minded. When you're going through something, God has increase on his mind. Even while you're in your trial, God has increase. You ought to read Psalms 115 high. It's tell to tell you about God who is an increased mind. He said, I got you on my mind. We're coming into our greatest season. The time of increase. The time of abundance. Let's receive a million dollar offering right quick here. Yes.